Hi folks, so this is meant to be a quick introduction to sequences in the context of studying calculus. So here's the plan. We will introduce sequences as special types of functions, discuss basic terminology and notation, look at several examples, and then introduce notions of convergence and divergence. So a sequence is just a function with domain n, the set of natural numbers. So I mean, if your domain is just a set of natural numbers, then the graph of your sequence is just going to look like a collection of dots that are sort of evenly spaced along the x-axis, but you still have values. So you, you basically get a graph uh, of dots. And that's it. That's what a sequence is. But there's all sorts of uh, notation and convention that have been wrapped around sequences. So for usual functions, function names, we're not very creative. They're always f or g or h. And for arguments, we're even less creative. It's usually x, maybe t. And usual function notation is for the argument x, the value there would be f of x. Well, for a sequence, even though a sequence is a function, we've developed different ways of um, thinking about these kinds of functions. So function names can be all over the map. You can see just about any letter used for the name of a sequence. And arguments uh, tend to be um, M, N, K, or J. These are letters that somehow have been psychologically attached to integer values over the years. So um, you'll often see these used as the argument variables. And we use subscript notation. So instead of saying a of n, which would just be old school function notation, usually we say a sub n is how we read that. And so the subscript n is used uh, to denote the value of the sequence at the argument n. Now, once in a while, you will see good old school function notation. For example, on the TIA-84, um, your ability to enter a formula for a sequence uses um, basic uh, function notation. Another distinction for functions, we're used to calling inputs arguments and outputs are the values. But for a sequence, an input is often called an index and the output is often called a term. You should get used to this language and when you hear it, just you can translate on the fly, but, but we're really talking about inputs and outputs. Now, a standard function is usually referred to by name. You can often just say the function f. Um, for some reason, we shy away from doing that. So you rarely see someone just talk about the sequence a. You usually have to add some sort of decoration to it just to let everybody know that you're talking about a sequence. So these are the options you might see when referring to a sequence. And I said that the domain was the set of natural numbers, but it's often desirable to start somewhere besides one. So uh, zero, for example, is a popular choice. So your domain for a sequence, typically what happens is here are your integers and you pick a smallest index, a smallest argument, and your domain marches off from there. So generally the domain of a sequence is a set that looks like this. It's all the integers that are greater than or equal to some sort of minimum argument or index. Now the individual values of a sequence are called terms, as I mentioned before. So you might say, for example, that here the third term is negative 2, and here the ninth term is 13. But look what happens if your smallest index is not 1. So when the first index is not 1, then the business of using um, the index to count terms gets thrown off. Usually we just adjust this by using non-positive integers in an ordinal way. So we we adjust our language. So we might say in this case that the zeroth term of the sequence is two. Then we can say the first term is seven. So by doing this, we sort of reserve the right to attach the actual value of the index to the ordinal language. So this might be the first term using this language, even though literally it is the second term of the sequence. Um, but this is a sort of standard trick to get the language to agree. So where do sequences come from? Well, one um, obvious way to find a sequence is to just take a good old-fashioned function from pre-calculus and restrict your domain. So let's take 5 over x and restrict our uh, domain to the natural numbers. So here's a formula for our sequence, and we'll use subscript notation. And it's also um, quite good practice to explicitly include your domain just to eliminate any kind of um, ambiguity. So in this case, 
n greater than or equal to one is our domain. And so there's a perfectly happy sequence. Now in our study of calculus, we know that uh, this graph has a horizontal asymptote. The limiting value of, of f of x as x goes to infinity is zero. So what we're gonna do is just borrow this fact. Um, the sequence goes along for the ride and we will write that the limiting value as n goes to infinity of a n is zero. And so this is what we mean by a sequence converging. So here are the things we might say, all right, we could say the sequence a n converges or a n is a convergent sequence. The limiting value of a n is zero. The sequence a n converges to zero or a n goes to zero as n goes to infinity. That's a nice shorthand way to write this. Now, these aren't all equivalent actually you should notice that the first two statements don't convey as much information they're just asserting that the sequence converges to something but um, the actual limiting value is not included in that statement sometimes that's all you need to know you just need to know a sequence converges and you don't care what it converges to so you will hear this language so here's another example let's take the natural log function and once again restrict our domain to the natural numbers so a n is ln of n, n greater than or equal to one. Now we know that the natural log function grows without bounds. So here what we'll say is the limiting value as n goes to infinity of a n is infinity. And technically this means the limit doesn't exist, but we are describing a particular way it fails to exist, which is to say that the values uh, grow unbounded. And in this case, the language that comes along with um, this example, we might say that the sequence a n diverges a n is a divergent sequence, the sequence a n diverges to infinity, a n goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. And once again, please look at the first two. These do not convey as much information. We're saying the sequence fails to have a limit, but we're not saying the way in which that happens. So here's another one. Let's take four sine x and restrict our attention to, once again, the natural numbers. And we'll take a step back and look at this graph. And we realize that um, there's no horizontal asymptote. There's no limiting value. For the purposes of this sequence, these are basically random numbers between negative four and four. And so the best we can say in this case about the limit is that it does not exist. And um, there's really not much to say. The sequence an diverges or an is a divergent sequence. We can't even really describe usefully the way in which it fails to exist. The values bounce around, but we have no standard way of, of writing that fact. All right, let's change gears. Um, another way that you can get a sequence, or at least part of a sequence, is through actual sort of real world data. So for example, you could have the soybean crop yield in bushels per acre um, for various years here. And there's not much to be said about this example, except I want to point out that you should not punish yourself if you're studying a collection of data by using um, inconvenient indices. So these would be miserable indices to use for this problem. There's no reason to do this. What you should do is just introduce a new index. So let n be the years after 2000, and then you can replace this column with these more reasonable numbers. And now you should study this sequence and any kind of result you get from this, you can easily translate back into the real world problem by adding 2000. So um, don't forget that you can shift sequences along the argument axis, just like you can functions to come up with convenient um, indices. Okay, let's look at some more exotic uh, examples of sequences. So let dn be the nth digit in the decimal expansion of pi. So for example, D1 would be one, and D2 would be four, D3 would be one, and so on. And this sequence, uh, if you hadn't noticed, seems to occupy an elevated place in pop culture. Um, you can easily find songs devoted to reciting digits of pi. Um, Pn equals the nth prime number. This is a critically important sequence in number theory and mathematics. Um, one could say that there's a lot of high level math which is devoted just to understanding the structure of this sequence. Here's something a little more mundane. Um, suppose $3,000 is invested in an account that yields 6% each year. Find a formula for PN, the principal in the account after N years. This is a good example to show you why you might want to start somewhere other than N equals 1 for your index. So we'll, have, we'll use P0 for the principal. After one year then, you're going to have 3,000 times 
two years, 3,000 times 1.06 squared, etc. So then your formula for Pn is simply 3,000 times 1.06 to the n. And here's a nice geometric one for n in greater than or equal to 3. Let an denote the area of the regular n-gon inscribed in the unit circle. So here's a 3, a 4, a 5, a 6, and so on. Now it's pretty clear in this case that um, your natural domain for this sequence should start at the index 3. Um, and so here's a good example of why you want to be flexible about your minimum index in the domain of a sequence. And by the way, um, you don't have to do much explicit calculation to sort of know in your gut that this sequence converges. And in the spirit of Archimedes, you know that that limiting value of an as n goes to infinity should be pi. Uh, 